So good afternoon. My name is Michael Collins and I'm the Director General of the IIEA here in Dublin, of course. And I'm delighted to welcome so many of you here uh, this afternoon uh, joining us uh, for this webinar as we hear uh, from the Taoiseach on Ireland's ambitions and challenges in a changing world. Um, I'm delighted that we're also um, uh, joined by the Chairman of the Board of the IIEA, uh, Rory Quinn, and I'm just going to ask Rory to say a, um, a, a few words, if you wouldn't mind, Rory, uh, to welcome the Taoiseach. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, Taoiseach. Uh, you're very, very welcome to the Institute. Indeed, you are no stranger to North Great Georgia Street. This time last year, you were the first of party leaders uh, to start the political campaign that led to the last election. Uh, but today is a particular day for us because this is the first time that you have graced our presence as Taoiseach of this country. And we are very proud to have you here and you're most welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you, Rory. Uh, before I hand over to the Taoiseach, just one or two housekeeping points, if I may, uh, just to say that, um, I'll say well, again, so, a, a very warm welcome uh, to everybody. Um, at the end of the Taoiseach's remarks, we'll of course uh, take your questions and please asking. feel free to uh, send your questions in. I either after Taoiseach's remarks or, um, or, or uh, 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 as he's giving his remarks, uh, we're happy to take them at any stage. Uh, you should send them in via the Q&A function uh, that I'm sure you're all very familiar with now on your screens. And we'll get to as many of these questions as we can uh, in the time available. The Taoiseach will speak for about uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, please uh, try and keep your questions brief if you can uh, and on topic of course as well and I would say we'll get to as many of them in the time available and in asking questions please also if you wouldn't mind identifying yourselves and your uh, your affiliation if any. And just to confirm that this event uh, both the thesis remarks and the Q&A are on the record and please feel free also to connect uh, with the event on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And just to be aware, this event is also being live streamed. So Taoiseach, again, you're most, most welcome uh, to the IIEA, this time virtually. Uh, and, um, and indeed, it's very, very nice to welcome you back. So the floor is yours. Um, I'm handing over to you then. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to thank you, uh, Rory uh, and Michael and the IIEA as a whole for the invitation uh, to make this address. Uh, and to answer uh, questions afterwards. Uh, during my time, indeed, as Rory said, as leader of Fianna Fáil, I have uh, delivered a series of speeches here which have provided our commentary on the many and changing challenges facing our country and Europe as a whole. Last January, in the middle of our election campaign, I used one of these occasions to uh, set out our core beliefs about how Ireland should work with urgency and as a part of a strong international community. This touched on a range of urgent social, economic, uh, political and environmental issues. A lot has changed since then. The impact of a dramatic global pandemic and recession is beyond anything we talked about then. And in truth, we have some way to go before we know the full extent of its impact. If we look back at the pandemic of just over 100 years ago, it had political and social impacts, which recent research shows caused a much longer crisis than we have previously understood. By any measure, these are historic times and the demand of us all that we step up and accept our part in responding. The need for strong rules-based structures to guide how many countries behave is being challenged on many fronts. Economic and social pressures are, dem are demanding and at times radical re-evaluation of policies which were accepted without question until recently. And core values, including the fundamentals of democracy, are under attack in many places. In the place of a genuine ideological dispute, we are now confronted with a cynical strategy of division and misinformation. The appalling events of last week in Washington are part of a wider and more complicated series of urgent challenges. So no matter how you look at it, it is impossible to look at the last few years and miss the fact that this is a historic moment. No short address could possibly address all of the issues involved, 
But what I would like to do is to give you a sense of how this government intends to act, how we intend to make sure that Ireland is an active, constructive and effective uh, contributor to international developments. The challenges are profound, but history teaches us that they can be overcome. Central to this must be cooperation by states who share core values and the reinvigoration of strong rules-based organizations. Before I do this, I want to talk about the current state of the pandemic. We are at a moment balanced between deep danger and great hope. Just as they have done in the past for deadly diseases like polio and smallpox, it is through vaccination that we will be able to put this terrible virus behind us. Figures released yesterday show that vaccination here is moving forward at pace and primarily limited by the availability of the vaccine. But our hospitals are experiencing their most terrible weeks so far of the pandemic. The scale and pace of the increase in cases which we experienced has been well beyond anything predicted. Tough measures limiting public activities must re remain in place for the moment, and everyone will have to limit contacts for some time. These are dark days or Barnabuel, or gap of danger. But I know that we will get through it and we will see brighter times. And as I will set out in my remarks today, as we look to the year ahead and beyond, it is my belief that we can recover better and in a more sustainable way. This pandemic has shown in a very sharp way how interlinked our world is. No country can stand aside and ignore the global context for global social and economic inequality, organized misinformation, the erosion of core values, and the existential issue of climate change. We have to do more than recognize these issues. We need to contribute actively to global, international, and regional alliances and initiatives to tackle and to counter them. And that is why Ireland puts such store in our international engagement through the European Union and the United Nations in particular. The fundamentals on which our future peace, prosperity and planet depend can only be dealt with systematically and collectively by countries working together. There was a time when a statement like this would be seen as banal and taken for granted. But at the core of many of the political and economic crises of this moment, has been, an effort, has been an effort to strip this cooperation of legal strength and strong values. This government has taken up office with a shared determination that Ireland will not stand on the sidelines. With respect to all and an understanding of the limits of what a small state can expect to achieve, Ireland will be an engaged global actor. We will do this as a committed member of the European Union as an active member of other international bodies, and for the coming term, as a member of the United Nations Security Council. And this active and progressive policy is also what drives the approach of my government in terms of the island of Ireland and our relations with our nearest neighbor. The Good Friday Agreement is founded on the conviction that by working together on the basis of shared values and principles, we can transcend divisions and, prog and progress common interests. This is the premise that inspires the work of the Shared Island Unit, which I have established, and I'll return to its work later in my remarks. While the pandemic has limited the amount of bilateral contacts we have had between heads of state and government, since July, there has been a very active series, series of summits and discussions about core issues facing Europe and the wider world. External relations and global issues are becoming ever more prominent on our agenda. At last month's European Council meeting, we showed a shared commitment to moving forward on a range of issues at the same time. We endorsed a binding European Union target of a net reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 of at least 55% compared to 1990 levels, a crucial step towards a climate neutral European Union by 2050. Europe is rightly aiming to be a genuine global leader 
and climate action. We also address the urgent need to cooperate at home and further afield to tackle terrorism and violent extremism, both online and offline. In what I hope is the start of a new transatlantic dynamic, leaders welcome the incoming Biden-Harris administration and committed us to working closely with them. We will not agree on everything, but no serious progress on global challenges is possible without strong European Union-US cooperation. There are too many legitimate national interests within the European Union to have a seamless common foreign policy. But I very much get a sense from colleagues that they understand that, that in this area, we do need to be more active, show more urgency, and renew critical partnerships. The discussions are becoming more open as well, as frank, and the spirit has been constructive. We will do everything possible to help this spirit to develop further. Ireland's ambition is for the European Union to become an ever stronger advocate and actor in support of resilient, open, rules-based political and economic multilateralism. This is the most effective and indeed the only effective way to advance our interests and defend our values. The coalition government, which I lead, is unequivocally Euro positive. We want a union which is more effective, more resilient, and more committed than ever to the values upon which it was founded and has grown. Each of our parties comes to the issue of Europe from a different starting point. However, we share a determination that the union will prosper. We reject the false idea that sovereignty is compromised by respecting common policies and the rule of law within the union. In fact, it is an essential enabler of sovereignty. It was once said that a small country is one which has to worry about its existence. If looked at that way, membership of the union has been an unprecedented act of guaranteeing the sovereignty of once vulnerable states. Sean Lamas, my predecessor as Taoiseach and as leader of my party, participated as a young man in the revolution which founded this state. And in his final years, he led us towards Europe in order to protect and expand the sovereignty which that revolution won. One of the striking things about the debate within the United Kingdom about Europe in the decades before the Brexit referendum was the constant repetition of the idea that sovereignty is a zero-sum issue. We reject that idea, and just as importantly, we know that you never let up in confronting those who spread it. Anyone who cares to look can see how the European Union enhances opportunities for countries, the single market, shared trading policy, free movement, supports for agriculture, solidarity and cooperation in facing challenges like energy security and climate change, and the countless benefits to our citizens from participation in schemes like Erasmus to no roaming charges within the Union. The picture of what life can be like without those benefits is also beginning to be revealed. The government's position on this is clear, could not in fact be clearer. The European Union is Ireland's home. And while there are those who would like to undermine the Union, Ireland stands with those who seek to strengthen and reform it. And this is why I strongly supported increasing the fiscal strength of the Union so that it can do more than limit countries, it can directly enable growth. At July's summit, Ireland as a net contributor supported strongly a shared European approach to recovery and growth. I argued for an ambitious budget and a new recovery package. I believe an even more ambitious approach would have been justified. But what was agreed is historic and demonstrated a learning of one of the many lessons of how the European Union was not in a position to move, move uh, to more effectively help the worst hit economies during the Great Recession. Since joining the European Union, Ireland has contributed and benefited greatly in economic, social and financial terms. Over the next seven years, we will contribute significantly more to the European Union budget than we will receive in direct allocations from the budget. But the economic impact of the European Union must stop being assessed purely on the basis of fiscal transfers. Every single member of the European Union 
gets more out of it economically than it contributes in direct funding. A huge element of the dynamism and strength of German or French or Dutch or indeed Irish export and employment rests on participation in a strong single market and strong trading bloc. Millions of jobs and possibly trillions in taxes for funding social services have been enabled by the European Union. I believe we must start being more assertive in making this frankly unquestionable argument for the economic necessity of Europe for all members. And we must see the benefit to all of cohesion and a recovery shared by all. And I think it's also important to say that we must be more active in making the argument for free and fair trade across, across the globe. Of course, Ireland's focus on global issues will be especially strong now that we've taken our seat on the United Nations Security Council. Ireland has a proud record at the United Nations, both within its framework for advancing important policy initiatives and in our contribution to its vital peacekeeping efforts. We are committed to tackling global and international challenges in an orderly, rules-based manner. Members of the Irish Defence Forces have served under the UN flag with great distinction around the world since we joined in 1955. As I've said before, it is an enormous honour and responsibility for Ireland to serve on the Council for the next two years. In our election campaign, we promised to bring the values of empathy, partnership and independence to bear in our work. We will undertake that work in a spirit of determination, engagement and fairness. And we will work with all of our partners, including our partners in the European Union, as we take that work forward. Of course, the European Union, of which we are a part, is now a different place. Our neighbours in the United Kingdom, unfortunately and sadly, have chosen to leave. It was a decision based on a debate which I don't think could be described as having been informed by the reality of what was being proposed. After the past four years, indeed after 40 years of the impact of English Euroscepticism on the operation of the European Union, we need to move on and start again. This is so even for those of us who remain convinced of the error of the decision. When you first approached me to make this address, it was in November, and the immediate context you had in mind was the conclusion of the European Union-UK negotiations and what a post-Brexit landscape might look like from an Irish perspective. As we know, ultimately an agreement came late in the day on Christmas Eve, with the new trade and cooperation agreement now being provisionally applied. In overall terms, the agreement reached on Christmas Eve, together with the withdrawal agreement, including the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, means that Ireland's key objectives in the Brexit process have been achieved. In particular, the agreements reached with the United Kingdom protect key elements of the Good Friday Agreement, including avoiding a hard border on the island, ensuring tariff and quota free trade with the United Kingdom and protecting Ireland's place in the single market. I don't think it can be, it can be repeated enough that the Good Friday Agreement was directly enabled by the fact that we shared membership of the European Union with the United Kingdom and that the European Union did everything possible to facilitate and support it. And we deeply appreciate the support and solidarity of the European Union member states and institutions, not least in addressing and defending those issues and concerns that were of particular or unique concern to Ireland throughout the negotiations. There is no avoiding the truth, however, that as much as we have worked to mitigate its impact, Brexit requires us to manage very damaging developments. These include considerable change and greater complexity especially for anyone seeking to do business with Great Britain into the future. Now that Brexit has become a reality, we are seeing operational effects on supply chains and in ports on trade between Great Britain and the European Union countries, including Ireland. We have put substantial resources into preparing for Brexit, including legislation, supports for business and other sectors and stakeholder outreach. I want to take the opportunity, this opportunity, to commend the many thousands of Irish companies, big and small, who've also prepared for these changes in the most difficult of circumstances. I know 
that there are some who are still working to familiarize themselves with the new systems, checks and controls, which go with trading with a non-European Union country. There never was such a thing as a good Brexit for Ireland. But we are working hard to minimize the negative consequences. I believe the agreement reached is the least bad version of Brexit, given the political circumstances. At many stages throughout the negotiations of both the withdrawal agreement and the new trade and cooperation agreement, there was an expectation in some quarters that competing national interests would cause the European Union 27 unity to crumble. There was undoubtedly support in some circles for what might be called the divide and conquer approach. Some of the at the time almost feral anti-EU forces hoped that they could even unravel the entire union. However, European Union, union unity and solidarity held to the end, not least in the real commitment to protecting key elements of the Good Friday Agreement. The union's negotiating team, led by Michel Barnier, did as they promised and delivered a final agreement which protects our interests and Europe's interests. For this, we will always be grateful to them. We see that solidarity reflected not just in terms of the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland, but in the continuation of the peace programme under the new financial framework of the Union to 2027, and in the Brexit Adjustment Reserve that offers support to member states and sectors most affected by Brexit. Brexit has also demonstrated the need to constantly take stock of where we stand as a country and what we need to do to progress. Our upcoming National Economic Plan will set out this new government's objectives for economic recovery post-Brexit and COVID-19 and the pathway to shape and build a renewed economy for the future. Our economy will be underpinned by a two-pronged approach. Firstly, we will have renewed focus on domestic SMEs, a sector which has borne much of the brunt of COVID-19 and Brexit, and which is critical to a broad-based jobs-led economic recovery right across our island. For this sector, while Britain will remain an essential trading partner, in the medium to longer term, we are likely to see an accelerated diversification in Irish export products and markets, a reorientation in certain supply chains away from the GB to your EU sources, and greater incentives for Irish businesses to remain internationally competitive. In 2021, the challenge will be to continue to support businesses as they make these changes. Secondly, we will work hard to maintain our global positioning as a knowledge-based country, which is secure, rules-based and connected, with a deep talent pool, taking a lead in digital and climate transformation, and part of the seamless trading environment of the European Union's single market. All of this gives enormous strength potential, resilience and sustainability to all sectors of a diversifying Irish economy, including our deep and broad multinational sector. Looking to this year and beyond, we continue to work to minimise lasting effects of COVID through the provision of labour market supports to those who have lost jobs or the opportunity to work throughout the pandemic. The Irish economy has the capacity to recover relatively quickly from the crisis once the circumstances allow. Indeed, with the vaccination being rolled out over the coming months, the combination of our access to European supports, as well as domestic policy supports, elevated household savings and pent-up demand should provide an environment for a sustainable recovery of the domestic economy. We also have to be a strong voice for a strong and equitable global recovery, based on global access to vaccines and to finance and continued support of open and fair trade. I am extremely conscious that we must now write a new chapter in our relationship with the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom will always be a close partner. We must now renew and strengthen a relationship which for nearly half a century involved a shared structure of debates, legislation, and so much more. Prime Minister Johnson and I have discussed this at length, and we are agreed on that important goal. We have committed to putting arrangements in place in 2021 to underpin the next chapter. We are committed to working together to develop an ambitious new agenda to reset and refresh our cooperation 
in the post-Brexit context. Working together to enhance connectivity and to tackle climate change, to name but two, could deliver real and meaningful benefits to all of our people. We are agreed on the need to develop structures for regular meetings at heads of government, ministerial and senior official levels in order to deliver on agreed programmes of work on matters of practical cooperation. The common travel area between these islands is essential and protecting its practical operation means we must develop and maintain a new level of cooperation. We must not become strangers because we missed the deeply daily connections we had in the European Union. We cannot just meet at high profile events or to talk about distinct projects. During my time as a member of government, I always valued the exchanges I had with counterparts in London and the devolved governments. This helped with policy development, with anticipating problems and creating a foundation of trust so that problems could be prevented from becoming crisis. As well as putting in place a new framework for Ireland-United Kingdom relations, I look forward also to the opportunity to deepen Ireland's relationship with the devolved administrations in Scotland and Wales. We intend to develop distinct programmes of cooperation with each of those administrations in the coming months. Looking beyond these islands, despite the turbulence of Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic, longer term strategic work must continue. Even with the enormous economic pressures of the pandemic, we are pushing ahead with a programme to significantly expand Ireland's presence and impact internationally. This year, we will open new embassies in Manila, Babat and Kiev, as well as a new consulate in Manchester, covering Northern England. Plans for a consulate in Miami are also underway. In September, we announced the design for a new landmark Ireland house in Tokyo, which will serve as a flagship model for the concept across the mission network when it opens its doors in early 2024. We're also finalizing works for new Ireland houses in Mumbai, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Across government, we are supporting efforts to grow and diversify export markets, inward investment, and tourism. We are determined to strengthen our bilateral relations with like-minded countries and to support the alliances necessary to advance Ireland's interests in a rapidly changing geopolitical landscape. While the reach of our diaspora is global, I'm particularly mindful speaking, you to, speaking to you today that the United States of America, the home of perhaps Ireland's largest diaspora, will in the coming days complete the transition from the Trump presidency to that of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. The eyes of the world are on this transition, more so than ever after recent events. In Ireland, we feel a particular affinity, given that Joe Biden has been a stalwart friend of Ireland throughout his long and decorated history of public service. In my conversation with him in the days after his victory, it was clear, it was clear, that he is passionate about both his Irish heritage and the idea of Ireland as a constructive friend at a time of great challenge for his country and the world. I think we must also recognise the election of Kamala Harris as Vice President as a moment of tremendous significance and a positive milestone. In a world where all too often ideas of diversity and equality are being challenged, she will be a powerful new voice for progress. In spite of the appalling events of recent days and weeks, I have great confidence in the strength of US democracy and its commitment to democratic norms and the rule of law. The US has so often been a beacon to the world and for the idea that nations must always seek to challenge themselves and address their deepest flaws. It is a testament to the strength and resilience of the US democratic institutions that Congress resumed the process of certifying the presidential election results just hours after the dramatic events at the Capitol. From a bilateral Irish perspective, we look forward to greatly to a Biden presidency. A number of members of the incoming administration are well known to us, and we will be starting from a point of mutual friendship and respect. That is not to say that there will not be complex issues to be dealt with around trade and investment, around climate change and immigration, around peace and security, and that's okay. What is never okay 
is trying to pretend that complex, complex bilateral and global issues can be solved by unilateral decrees. That is an approach built on sand. All of this brings me back to where all this starts, at home, on this island. Because of course, how we make our way in the world starts with how we shape our lived experience on this island, our shared island. The government's shared island initiative is about harnessing the potential of the Good Friday Agreement to build a better future for everyone on the island, north and south. The goal which underpins and inspired the Good Friday Agreement is reconciliation. This is unfortunately, has not always been evident in the years since the agreement was ratified by the votes of all parts of our island. And like the European Union, the goal of reconciliation is achieved through the Good Friday Agreement by working in a sincere, ambitious and effective partnership across borders to deliver meaningful improvements in people's lives and address common challenges together. The initiative puts a renewed focus on doing just that, so that as the agreement commits us, we strive in every practical way towards reconciliation. The genius of the agreement is that it enables normal politics, but creates extra shared space for old divisions to be overcome. <laughs> Each of us retains the right to seek different outcomes to the governance of the country. However, we also carry the duty to address other entrenched problems. In budget 2021, we announced the Shared Island Fund. The fund to which half a billion will be allocated speaks to the scale of our ambition and of our readiness to pursue significant collaborative north-south investments that will benefit people across the island. We are working now with the Northern Ireland Executive and through the North-South Ministerial Council to drive the delivery of infrastructure projects that we have already agreed. For instance, in December, from the Shared Island Fund, the government approved six million in funding to launch the delivery of phase two of the Ulster Canal. And we're working to progress joint investment with the executive in the A5 road transport corridor and the narrow water bridge project. It's a powerful statement of what we can achieve, that, once, that where once our relations were defined by disputes, we are quite literally sitting down and discussing building bridges between us. We also want to progress a new generation of north-south investments, working with the executive and with the British government. For example, we are actively looking at an all-island research program to bring together the capacities and expertise of universities and industry, north and south. As we have done in the past in critical areas like energy security, I know we can deliver world-leading research and innovation that can support new jobs and economic opportunities on the island. We will commission a comprehensive programme of research, working with independent bodies such as the SRI and NESC, and this research will contribute to considerations both in government and in wider society on how we can further develop a shared island agenda and harness the full potential for mutually beneficial cooperation under the Good Friday Agreement. And it's always good to keep talking. So I've also launched a Shared Island Dialogue series to support constructive and inclusive engagement by civil society across a range of issues, such as the environment, health and education, looking at how best we can collectively build a shared future on the island. Our Shared Island Initiative is a broad, positive and inclusive endeavour which all communities and traditions can engage with in confidence. It is how we will take the next necessary essential steps on the journey to full reconciliation. The immediate work of limiting the damage of the pandemic dominates our work at the moment, as it does the work of all governments in Europe at the moment. However, this new government is also moving forward with an ambitious new agenda for relations on this island with our neighbour, with our fellow member states of the European Union and with the wider world. We understand the breadth and depth of the, new, of the unique challenges of the moment. We're absolutely clear in the values which we believe must define how those challenges are overcome. Ireland will be an advocate for a strong and effective European Union defined by democracy, the rule of law and solidarity. We will actively engage bilaterally and through international organisations 
to support open and fair trade, combat disinformation, protect democracies, and promote understanding. Whether we, are, whether we are acting globally or locally, challenges are best faced in solidarity together, and solutions are best found through partnership with pragmatism and with principles. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you uh, indeed, Tishuk. Um, appreciate those that, that very um, extensive um, range of issues that you've addressed in the course of your speech, and they will provide indeed a very uh, solid and timely context uh, for our work uh, in the IEA throughout the course of this year and indeed um, uh, into the future. We're going to take a few questions now, Tishuk, uh, in the time available to us. Um, and I'd like to start with, with John McGrain. I, I know you've, you've, you've addressed John McGrain from the, um, the, the, the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. Um, I know you've um, addressed this issue, but he wants to know how important do you think it is um, uh, for us all now to turn our attention to rebooting relations between our two islands? And what do you see as the steps we can take towards that? And maybe I just add a little rider to that myself. Do you, do you think that, um, that, that, that there is room or the capacity or necessity indeed for uh, new institutional arrangements uh, between the islands? Or is that already adequately covered uh, under the agreement? The Good Friday Agreement. Yes. Um, to, uh, in relation to John and, and your own questions, I, I think it's extremely important um, and it's on my agenda and the government's agenda um, to really focus on the British-Irish relationship. Um, from my experience, that relationship was the glue, was the underpinning, as you would know, of all of the work that led to the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement, but also critically then that transformed the relationships uh, between Britain uh, and Ireland. And I have spoken uh, to, to the British Prime Minister last August, we agreed that we would ask our officials to work on this uh, in terms of um, looking at how we could develop new structures. And I think we will need to develop agreed approaches and possibly structures in terms of that bilateral relationship in a post-Brexit context, so that the bilateral issues are nurtured, have energy, um, but that there's uh, you know, ongoing, timely, structured interactions between uh, uh, the Prime Minister and the Taoiseach, uh, and indeed between ministers, uh, and officials, and um, our officials are working with, with UK government officials on that. Uh, and um, you know, we hope to have a, a, an engagement uh, in, in the coming while to to cement that. That that's extremely important in our view. And economically, Britain uh, is still an enormous uh, partner to, to Ireland. And we and we to Britain, uh, we're the fifth largest export market uh, for the UK. So it's extremely important that we get this right. Uh, do you think, Tishuk, I mean, uh, it's quite clear from what you're saying and what you've said uh, over the last number of months that there is a great appetite here for, for rebooting, indeed, uh, the relationship. Do you feel that that is reciprocated on the other side and there's an equal sense of, of determination and urgency um, uh, within the British government, uh, led by the Prime Minister, of course, uh, to, to, to meet us uh, on this, uh, in this challenge? Yes, I do. I do get that sense. Um, obviously, as I said earlier, governments are very much focused on the COVID emergency right now. Uh, but even prior to the agreement, you know, uh, the Prime Minister and I were in contact about this and the need really to, to push forward in terms of um, rebooting, resetting the Irish-UK relationship. And what was interesting, I think, in the finalisation of the discussions around the protocol, for example, you know, relations between both sets of officials were, was very strong uh, and was constructive. Um, and um, so the relations are warm. Um, and obviously there will be challenges. Uh, so I think there is a good foundation there uh, to reset the relationship now in the post-Brexit -con context. Yeah, I just this may, may be a little bit granular, but nonetheless, it's from Gabriel Dennison, who's an I IEA member. He says the number of young people coming south uh, from Northern Ireland for third level education has fallen considerably over recent decades. Uh, would the Taoiseach consider seeking to attract a greater number of students from Northern Ireland to institutions of the Republic as part of the Shared Island Initiative? Yes, we'd be, we would be open to that, although there would, and there will be changes. We're watching the, the situation in Scotland, for example, in terms of um, the reimposition of fees, for example, on, on, on Irish students generally. That's going to create a, a new dynamic in terms of where students from North and South go. Um, I, I've long been of the view that you know, working together, I think of many students staying within Northern Ireland as well as important uh, in terms of uh, future developments. That that's something we shouldn't lose sight of. So the idea of 
and I'm working with Minister Simon Harris on this in terms of partnerships between our third level institutions. And so you, you saw the announcement in relation to the Erasmus program being available to students in Northern Ireland. That is very, very important. Uh, and so I think stronger linkages between our colleges uh, could be a very effective way uh, in, in terms of future participation on the island in terms of education. But yeah, we're, we, we're, we're always open to students, of course, and, and students come from Northern Ireland uh, to, to, to the Republic, um, and, and that will continue. Um, and um, but we part of the relationship will have to be understanding the needs, concerns, and strategies of the third level colleges in Northern Ireland as well. Uh, and that we work complementary with those institutions to support them and enhance their offering um, and, and not in any ways undermine perhaps their strategies. You should get my meaning on that. Yeah. And, and do you think, Tishik, I mean, um, obviously Northern Ireland is in a very special position now uh, vis a vis the European Union. Um, do, do, you, do you sense that there's um, a, a, a willingness and a, and a capacity there to work more closely with us? Uh, as 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 interests that would affect, as issues that affect them within the European Union come to the table in Europe, um, a table at which you'll be present and a lot of ministers will be present, but they will not be present. Uh, how are we going to, uh, I suppose, uh, best uh, facilitate their unique situation? And I suppose, uh, will you be putting in place structures? I suppose to uh, to ensure uh, that their interests are best protected or protected going forward within this very very unique arrangement. First of all, I think Northern Ireland has a lot to gain from this unique arrangement. I think uh, I've often said, I said it before um, at the IEA that this would potentially um, what was, uh, you know, in terms of its continuing access to obviously to the UK market and the European Union single market, that it represented a very significant opportunity economically um, for businesses and industry in Northern Ireland. And I still believe that. Uh, I think what's critical is we as rapidly as we can depoliticize the whole Brexit debate now and, and get on with pragmatic um, working out and operationalizing uh, the protocol and so on uh, and trying to simplify and ease the trading environment for all of the companies and businesses involved. Yes, we will do whatever we can to make sure that there's continued access to information uh, to various um, institutions in Europe. Uh, Europe is very, very open uh, to supporting Northern Ireland and, and underpinning the peace uh, agreement and, and the Good Friday Agreement. And that was very evident in the peace funding where we got you know, an increased allocation uh, in the most recent round of funding, which, of course, when it's multiplied by uh, contributions from the UK and ourselves, will, will mean a very substantial fund now, uh, EU peace fund, up out uh, to 2027. Um, so I, I think we, we need to get into the practical operationalization of the, the, the trade and cooperation agreement and the protocol that, that that's key i think um, and uh, slightly worried at times there's ongoing political debate going on about uh, the protocol and so on by, by some involved in, in the political arena whilst it's natural at, at one level i really get a sense from all of the stakeholder engagements over the last year or two that civic society in the north people involved in agriculture people involved in industry and business and they just want to get on with it now and try and optimize the situation for their own employees and for their own companies. And that's where my focus would be to be practical and help in any way we can. Um, there's a question here from Peter Mitlone. Uh, it was an IAA board member. He says, Tishuk, are you confident that relations between the US and Europe and uh, globally under the Biden administration will improve? And in what areas should we look for real signs of improvement uh, in the coming months? That's from Peter Mitlone. I am, um, and um, I, I got a sense from my conversation with, with President-elect uh, Joe Biden uh, that he wanted to rapidly reset that relationship with Europe, and so he instanced, for example, uh, climate, uh, that he wanted to uh, rejoin the Paris Accord. Um, day one is the, is the language he used. Um, for example, he wants to rejoin the World Health Organization. Uh, which was music to my ears in the sense that I believe, as I said earlier, in, in terms of these, you know, the importance of multilateral organizations like the WHO and, and others. Um, uh, and I, so I think we see, I think, early momentum on the climate uh, and maybe in terms of, 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 of the, the, the Iran issue as well and the nuclear issue. Um, so I do see a more multilateral thrust coming from the new administration, which I think will sit well with the European Union, which is anxious 
to reset the relationship as well. But I also get a sense within the European Union there's a realisation that it can't be just business as normal, that Europe needs to up its game as well and step up in terms of its of its commitments. And I think, interestingly, the UK, I think, is, 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 could be part of that approach. And that's why it's so important that we did get a trade and cooperation agreement with the UK, uh, because I do sense that there's an opportunity here uh, to have a counterweight to the other weights of authoritarianism that's emerging across the world and, and, and other forces. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful about that and, and confident about it. And, and, and Tishuk, um, how confident would you be that, that, that you'll find yourself physically in Washington on St. Patrick's Day? Or is that, um, in the current circumstances, is that, um, is that a level of ambition that's realistic? I mean, given the pandemic. I think obviously the, the course of the of, of, of the virus would, would dictate a lot of that. Uh, when I invited President Biden, elect Biden to Ireland, he just said, "Try and keep me out." So I hope any lack of enthusiasm on his side. But I think we'd be practical about it. It's early days yet, but uh, obviously COVID will have a significant impact on all bilateral relations and in, in, in our like, contacts and meetings in the coming way. Okay, a uh, question here, just uh, a journalist question, if I may, teacher from uh, Tommy Meskill in RTE News. Uh, coming back to Brexit and just the, the, the some of the, uh, the, the the challenges that are there on the, the freight side at the moment. Um, and um, he, he wants to know, um, how would you respond to the concerns uh, outlined in the letter from the Irish Freight Transport Association? They warned of disappearing supply chains, empty supermarket shelves and rising unemployment due to the impact of Brexit on trade between Ireland the UK and Europe. Yeah, I, I read that correspondence um, this morning, and um, I, I share uh, their concerns. Uh, that said, uh, you know we've employed an additional fifteen hundred people um, uh, to to manage uh, all of this, and it really underlines the reality, uh, which we have been saying for some months, that even a trade deal uh, would represent significant disruption and would cause significant disruption. Uh, and you know we're at pains to say that the company's in advance of of, of, of um, Brexit, uh, and so what we're witnessing now is the realization of Brexit on the daily lives of all of us. That said, uh, we will working with our state agencies and with revenue do everything we possibly can to minimize um, the disruption, minimize the impact on on hauliers, on companies, on supply chains. I've been talking to some of our companies uh, over the, during the week on this um, specific issue. Um, and in terms of the, the new arrangements, uh, the new requirements. Uh, and uh, we're certainly going to work very hard indeed to, to help and to be assistance to, to our companies. Um, but it does really illustrate um, the practicalities, the negative practicalities of Brexit. We're moving from a situation where prior to this, we would have been dealing with about 2 million uh, customs declarations annually to 20 million um, annually. Uh, and so does, and I would accept that there's been a lot of learning here for many, many companies and for many uh, uh, stakeholders in this, in this process. Um, about 70% of all uh, uh, goods are uh, coming in and goods coming in is being green routed. So no delays there, uh, but still there's a significant, uh, there are significant issues there that we have to continue to address. Yeah, Tishuk, um, just one here from uh, Michael Patton uh, from Glanbia. Um, it's not a, a specifically a Glanbia question, but it relates to misinformation, disinformation, and um, uh, the type of thing we've seen um, in, in recent months, indeed years. He said, Tishuk, we've seen democracy in the United States, and I think you referred to this in your speech, of course, but he says, Tishuk, we have seen democracy in the USA undermined through misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories, and unfiltered cyber bullying online. He says the same trends are in Ireland too, particularly in online political discourse and misinformation, i.e. in relation to vaccines. How can we manage this challenge in Ireland? Uh, I think it's an enormous challenge. Uh, I think it's an enormous challenge to democracy uh, and political systems who are challenged by it, particularly the rapidity of opinion formation, the rapidity of the mounting pressure on a given issue on a given week or a given day um, and putting enormous pressure on governments and on parliaments. Um, and I do think both here and within the EU and globally, we need to really evaluate this challenge in terms of misinformation, uh, in, in, in terms of the, you know, the pressure that can lead to the type of uh, um, 
uh, incidents we saw in, at the capital in, in, in the US um, last week, uh, and in terms of uh, in, in the Irish context, uh, as Michael said, in terms of vaccines and that, and and, and other areas. So, um, and also, you know, you look at what happened in the last week. Um, whatever one, and uh, you know, I think what happened last week was shocking. Yet, two individuals can decide who would have a platform, and that, that's an interesting observation as well. You know, if you uh, read a very interesting article last week, uh, last night, in the New York Times, around this issue, a very extended article on. The, 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 the power, the influence between sovereign governments elected and uh, major companies now um, in terms of social media platforms. And it's a fascinating debate. I'm not so sure that the leaderships of these platforms, to be fair to them, want to be wielding um, huge power or significant power. But the reality is now that that is the reality. And I think it's we need an engagement on that because um, democracy, in my view, is under threat. Um, and um, our whole way of life is changing because of social media, and we do need to interrogate that more and understand it more and be in a position to look after our people um, more. Um, that, that documentary, The Social Dilemma, I uh, don't know whether you're familiar with it, uh, I think is one that most people should should, should watch because it illustrates the, uh, the new dynamic that is in our lives, individual lives, uh, in our families and in our societies. Uh, Tishik, we're coming uh, kind of tight on time here. Just one or two more questions, if we may. Fine. Um, fine. One uh, from um, uh, Dr. Declan DC. He says, um, Tishik, you said in your introduction that it's through vaccination that we will be able to put this virus uh, behind us. Uh, he, say, uh, she say, he says, Health Minister Stephen Donnelly has indicated that 4 million Irish people could be vaccinated by the end of September. Uh, do you think that's achievable? Um, I, I do. I think the European Union, and could I say that I actually endorse and am a strong supporter of what has happened in terms of the European Union approach, in terms of having a joint approach to pre-purchase vaccines. I think smaller countries would have been in difficult situations trying to compete with larger states for available vaccines. So this was a very fair way of doing it, and in terms of having a broad range of companies to sign up with. Um, so that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that um, you know, the, our, our own capacity, uh, we're, we're doing well now uh, in European terms, we're well up there um, in terms of uh, the league table, so to speak, although that can change in terms of the administration of vaccines. But we've had a low, relatively low level of, of vaccines in so far across Europe relative to what would happen in the second quarter of the year. Uh, and the second quarter is going to be critical. Uh, and so the National Task Force, led by Green and uh, is working hard in terms of the logistics of the various phases of this operation, working with Paul Reid at the HSC, who I, think are, who I think are doing a fantastic job, really genuinely I say that, from testing and tracing capacity being expanded, um, you know, to talk to, to very significant levels in the last week, to the vaccine rollout, and to coping with incredible pressures on our hospital systems. Um, so um, we have the capacity to, to achieve that. Uh, and I, I'm looking to midsummer for significant numbers of our people having been vaccinated. The AstraZeneca vaccine is the next crucial one. Um, and we're awaiting authorization towards the end of this month on that. Uh, and that in itself would be a significant game changer in terms of ramping up uh, the vaccination uh, of our people. Tishik, I'm just, uh, we're coming as a, towards uh, the end here, maybe just uh, one or two questions um, additionally, if we may. Um, just in Europe, um, I mean, obviously we're going to see big changes in Germany this year. Uh, Angela Merkel's 16-year uh, term as Chancellor will be coming to an end um, in September after the election, uh, the German election that is. Uh, obviously a party leadership change in Germany this uh, weekend uh, to, be, to be announced. Um, how uh, confident or how concerned would you be about uh, the capacity of European leadership post-Merkel, um, uh, given the fact that any new person coming into the job will, will, will inevitably will take some time, but will Europe uh, be, be, be at a loss? Uh, for the leadership that uh, in your speech you identify obviously is, is clearly very important. Will, will Europe have a loss uh, of, of key leadership at a critical moment, particularly in the post-Merkel environment? Well, well first of all, uh, Chancellor Merkel has been an exceptional leader um, and a Taurus strength uh, with a deep, deep commitment uh, um, to the European Union and continues, she continues to be a Taurus strength at EU Council meetings. I, I've witnessed it at first time during the uh, German presidency. 
in terms of both the French-German dynamic being at the heart of the new fiscal arrangement in terms of not just the multi-annual financial framework, but also the recovery fund. I mean, that was really a historic development within the EU context led by the German-French French, uh, axis. Uh, I think that will continue. I think uh, uh, President Emmanuel Macron is very, very deeply wedded uh, to, to that uh, concept uh, and to uh, the German-French uh, motor, if you like, and, and, and driver uh, of continued European Union cohesion. Uh, and we saw it re most recently under the German presidency, again, uh, both the leadership of Chancellor Merkel and the French president in making sure that after 23 hours of a uh, probably a long meeting at the EU Council, we got agreement on, on, on the climate change targets and, and, and ambitions. Uh, and so there's a really deep commitment, I think, there. And um, I think the legacy, uh, when we eventually get there, of, of Angela Merkel, Merkel will be one that will be lasting. And I think, you know, different leaders uh, emerge in time. Uh, and I do believe we can be confident that that access will continue, that the German-French relationship will continue to be at the heart of, of maintaining cohesion and an ambitious Europe uh, into the future. Just maybe one final question from Ian Heaton from the from Northern Trust. I mean, it's not uh, uh, directly on, on, um, on, well, it is directly on topic, I suppose it relates to the pandemic and the public finances. Uh, uh, he wants to know, Taoiseach, um, can the Taoiseach please advise how he balances the immediate competing priorities of the pandemic and the medium term impact uh, on the public finances? Yeah, with, with considerable difficulty, uh, and that's something we've been endeavouring to do all year. That said, you know, we we, uh, we are in a position uh, to borrow uh, the, the necessary funding uh, to underpin the levels of support that we're giving to industry and business, and indeed to income supports to people throughout the pandemic. And in the budget that we um, passed uh, last year, we put in substantial contingency funding to deal um, with the pandemic itself. Uh, and so notwithstanding this third wave, which is at levels that uh, we didn't predict, uh, we do have sufficient funding put aside uh, to, to, to help businesses get through this particular phase. Uh, what would worry us, of course, is that certain businesses and certain sectors could be scarred for a longer term as a result of this. So we are worried about that. And we're keeping a very close eye on certain sectors because we do realize post-COVID that we will have to intervene to really support certain sectors to come back, uh, particularly on the domestic side. And the National Economic Recovery Plan will be very much focused on that. Uh, the Brexit Adjustment Reserve Fund is, is a substantial help in terms of the Brexit issues, but we've already allocated significant monies now uh, in terms of post-COVID recovery um, as well. Uh, and um, so, so we're, we're, we're conscious of this. We think we, you know, we're very clear in 2021, we have the resources to deal with this. Uh, and we will deal with it. Um, uh, and um, I think, the, as I said, the vaccination program offers the balancing dimension now that we didn't have last year, uh, essentially, that one can see light at the end of this tunnel. Sure. Uh, we're going to draw um, the event uh, to a close, if we may. Um, I just want to thank you uh, for sharing your time with us so generously indeed, um, and covering such a vast terrain um, of, 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 of issues. Um, in your remarks and indeed in the Q&A as well. Um, I want to thank everybody for all the questions and beg their forgiveness for not getting to each and every one of them. I think we, we covered a range and, um, and, and, and obviously a lot of issues were covered in your speech themselves itself. Um, you have an incredibly challenging agenda uh, to manage over the coming months, uh, which will set a course uh, for Ireland in so many vital areas. So we want to wish you the very best. We at the IDA will continue to uh, to explore these matters, to, um, uh, to, 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 to generate ideas uh, and to bring forward the debate in whatever way we can. And in that context, next week indeed, we have uh, Natalie Loiseau, uh, the French MEP on Monday. We have uh, an event with the IDA on Tuesday dealing with foreign direct investment um, and, uh, and, 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 and all of that, 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 and the importance of all of that. And then, of course, we have uh, Simon Coveney, Minister Simon Coveney, will be with us on Friday to look in more depth, perhaps, uh, at some of the issues that Ireland will be addressing within the, uh, our membership of the Security Council of the United Nations. So, I just want to say a very, very warm thank you uh, on a personal note, as well as on behalf of everybody in the Institute. We really do look forward to getting you back or having you back in person in North Great Georgia Street, uh, just as circumstances um, permit, which yes. we hope will be reasonably soon. So, thank you very much indeed.
Yeah, may I thank you, uh, Michael and Rory, and uh, all of the team and all the members. I really appreciate the work that you've been doing for so many, many years uh, in terms of the furtherance of ideas, thinking, and insights, and particularly uh, the uh, ongoing support and giving people uh, opportunities to learn more and more about the European Union and its centrality to our development and growth. Really appreciate that, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, teacher. Good day now to everybody. Thank you.